You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Welcome. My name is Frank Ambrosio. I'm the co-director of the My Dante Project at Georgetown University. It's my great pleasure today to welcome you to a reading of Inferno, the first canticle of Dante's Divine Comedy. It's voiced by Danny Fitzpatrick, and he's reading his own translation of the poem, which he recently completed in commemoration of the 700th anniversary of Dante's death in 1321. Poetry is meant to be spoken and heard. As Danny speaks, listen for the simplicity and economy of the English words and rhythms which Danny has discovered at work in Dante's native Italian. In their music and textures, we hear the primal power with which they break forth from silence, revealing the whole world, together with all of us, the living and the dead. So let's join Danny Fitzpatrick now on Dante's Journey. Hello and welcome back to the Dante in a Year podcast. Today we conclude our reading of Dante's Inferno with Canto 34. Vexilla regis prodeunt inferno against us, so gaze ahead, said my master, if you would discern him. As when a thick mist breathes, or when night falls on our hemisphere, and from afar appears a mill the wind spins, I seem to see one such figure. Then for the wind I drew myself behind my leader, for there was no other cover. Now I was, and with fear I put it in meter, there where the shades were all covered, and showed through a straw in glass. Some are lying down, others stand erect, that one by the head and that by the feet, another as a bow, the face bent down to the feet. When we had advanced so far that it pleased my master to show me the creature who had been so beautiful, he brought me forward and made me stand back, saying, Behold this, and see the place where it falls to you to arm yourself with fortitude. How I then became so cold and faint, don't ask, reader, for I don't write it, since all I could say would be too little. I did not die, and did not remain alive. Think now for yourself, if you have the genius, what I became, deprived of one and the other. The emperor of the dolorous kingdom issued from the ice in the midst of the breast, and I myself come closer to a giant than giants are to his arms. See now how much all of him must be in comparison to such a part. If he was as lovely as he's ugly now, and lifted his brow against his maker, well ought every loss proceed from him. Oh, what a grand marvel appeared to me when I saw three faces on his head. The one before was Vermilion. There were two others which were joined to this over the middle of each shoulder, and each joined at the place of the crest. And the right appeared between white and yellow. The left was such as those people who live there from which the Nile falls. Below each issued two great wings, large enough to lift so large a bird. I've never seen such sails at sea. They had no feathers, but were in the fashion of a bat's wings, and they fluttered so that three winds moved from them. Here comes all the cold of Cocytus. He wept with six eyes, and from three chins dropped tears and bloody dribble. In the teeth of each mouth he ripped apart a sinner in the guise of milled grain, so that three then suffered at once. To that before the gnawing was nothing against the clawing, where sometimes just a skein remained of all the barren skin. That soul up there who has the greater pain, said the master, is Judas Iscariot, who has his head within and beats his legs without. Of the other two that have their heads below, that who hangs from the black snout is Brutus, see how he squirms and says nothing, and the other is Cassius, who seems so full-bodied. But night rises again, and now we must depart, for we have seen all. As pleased him, I held him about the neck, 
and he picked the time and the proper place, and when the wings had opened out enough, he gripped the fleecy side. Then he descended fleece to fleece between the full pelt and the cold crust. When we were there where the thigh turns, at the point on the thick of the hips, my leader, fatigued and anguished, turned his head where that one had his shanks, and grasped the pelt as a man who climbs, so that I believed we were returning to the inferno. Hold on well, for by such stairs, said the master, panting like a spent man, we must depart from such evil. Then out he went through a puncture in the rock and he placed me on the edge to sit. He put himself near me with short steps. I lifted my eyes and believed I'd see Lucifer as I'd left him, and I saw his legs held upward. And if I became so distressed, let the dull people consider who don't see what was the point that I'd passed. Lift yourself, said the master, onto your feet. The way is long and the walk is challenging, and now the sun returns to middle tierce. It was not the walkway of a palace, there where we were, but a natural chamber with ill footing and a lack of light. Before I turn myself from the abyss, my master, I said when I had stood, tell me a bit to draw me out of error. Where is the glacier? And how is he now fixed thus upside down? And how in so short an hour has the sun shot from evening to morning? And he to me. You imagine yourself still there at the center, where I seize the pelt of the sinful worm that pierces the world. You were there as long as I descended. When I turned, you passed the point to which all weight is drawn on every side. And you are now brought beneath the hemisphere that's counterpoised to that which covers the dry land, and below its summit was consumed the man who was born and lived without sin. You have your feet upon a little sphere that makes the other face of Judeca. Here it is morning, when there it is evening. And that one whose pelt made us a stare is fixed still just as he first was. On this side he plunged from heaven, and the earth that first stood out here veiled itself in the sea for fear of him, and came to our hemisphere, and perhaps in fleeing him it left the place that will appear to us alone, and which coursed back upward. There is a place down there as far remote as the tomb will stretch from Beelzebub, not known by sight, but by the sound of a rushet that there descends through a hole it has corroded in a stone by its winding course and slopes a bit. The leader and I entered that hidden path to return into the clear world, and without care for a bit of repose, we climbed upward, he first and I second, enough that I saw the lovely things that heaven bears by a round aperture and then we issued to review the stars. That concludes our reading of Dante's Inferno. Thank you for joining me on this episode of the Dante in a Year podcast. We'll be back next time to begin our reading of Dante's Purgatorio. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.